What's up audit fans and welcome to a Q&A. I haven't done one of these for a while, but thank you to all the people who posted questions on YouTube, Twitter and Insta. So let's get into it. Okay, so we have a few questions about a range of different topics and I'll just try and work through these uh, sequentially. Uh, so the first question was about data analytics in audit and we've always done data analytics. So data analytics isn't really a new thing in auditing. Um, we've always looked at data, we've always analyzed it with computer assisted audit techniques. Data analytics is simply taking those existing techniques and then amping them up or putting them on steroids. So we're looking at larger data sets. We're using uh, certain tools to try and look at predictive um, analysis. You might be able to do more regression analysis. Um, but the key to doing any sort of data an analysis is number one, understand the data set. Know what the data set is telling you and what then it should be telling you based on the business processes. So to do any sort of data, data analytics in audit, I think you really need to understand the client and understand the data sets, which means understanding the information systems. Do I think it's going to be really important? Absolutely. I'm uh, in the process of developing a data analytics type of week within my auditing course, and I'll probably share some of that material on YouTube in the future. So I definitely think it's an important skill, um, but it's not a revolution in audit, so to speak. It's something we've always done, but maybe not to the same extent as we're probably going to start doing in the future. All right, the next question was from Usama and Usama asks how to answer audit report questions. Now, the key here with audit report questions is to know your standards. I haven't got to the series on audit opinions yet in my ISA, I, ASA videos, but I do have some content on how to answer or differentiate between the audit report questions. So the first thing is, should it be unqualified, unmodified? Uh, so therefore, is everything true and fair? If we don't think there are any material misstatements, then we can quite easily go for an unqualified opinion under ISA 700. The tricky part comes when we get to modification. So that's if we're going with qualified or adverse. First tip is always to figure out what sort of error is it? Is it an adjustment that management won't make? So a disagreement with management? Or is there a limitation on scope? Can't we get evidence on something? So first step, what sort of um, issue are we arguing with management about? That disagreement with management about a number or a disclosure or our inability to get evidence. Then step two is to make sure that we understand whether that misstatement or adjustment is material but not pervasive or material and pervasive. So once you know which of those it is, you can actually just jump into a particular uh, diagram in the appendix of 705 that will easily then tell you which audit opinion. And I've also got a video, I'll link to it. I can't remember, it's this side. <laughs> um, so that you can actually click on that and see my video about audit opinions. The next question was about the auditor's lien and that's L-I-E-N. Okay, um, and so a lien is a security or a form of collateral. And then that person clarified with me um, in regards to 230 about audit working papers remaining the property of the auditor. So when we're doing the audit, we get information from the client. I will not take a client's original documentation. Okay, I will always take a copy, but I will make that copy myself to know that it's authentic and a true copy of the original. So I will take that client information. I will probably, in the old days, I would have created paper copies, but now we have scans and uh, PDFs of those files. Those files, you know, technically that information is the clients. We receive um, permission to gather evidence as necessary. Those work papers though, belong to me as the auditor. They don't belong to the client they belong to the auditor. The thing that we give the client that they technically, I guess, own or they buy is the audit opinion. So the client cannot request from us um, any of our working papers or documentation unless we've taken the originals, which we should never do. If we have taken the originals, you may choose 
if for example the client is refusing to pay to say I'm not going to give them back to you until you pay your bill but that is pretty rare normally we would have our own copies um, so we wouldn't hold our work papers as some form of um, hostage before the client pays that's not normally how it goes within practice Okay, uh, the next question was from Zana, and Zana said, can you tell us about work in tax outsourcing? And I guess the key with any sort of outsourcing, and I'm not a tax expert by any means, is that companies have tax obligations, and that could be with superannuation, um, or uh, what the Americans would often call an IRA, um, or a retirement fund. We have tax obligations if there's goods and services tax, if there's company tax. Now, a company may choose to do all of that tax work themselves. So they might have their own tax accountants, or they may seek to get advice from a tax expert firm. So that could be a big four firm. It could be a medium tier or a small tier firm. Now, they might go to that firm for advice on what to do, and then they would build their own internal controls and policies and procedures to implement that advice from their tax expert. So it's unlikely that you would probably get PwC, for example, to run all your payroll and assume that your employee tax obligations are appropriate. You might get their advice on how to set it up and then set it up yourself. But it depends on the company. Some companies run pretty lean and they might outsource all of that tax work. Others might decide that they wanna keep it in-house and how they decide that will depend on their own business model. So there is lots of opportunities in tax. Um, tax specialists tend to be country specialists because tax is um, so much based on individual countries or even states in some instances. Um, but you know, it is a good path to go down if you've got a, a great mind for reading legislation because it is heavily entrenched in legislation. Most people that I do see going to tax have accounting and law combination degrees because that's a really great use of those law skills. So hopefully, Zana, that answered your question. What else have I got on here? All right. Is it possible that you can assign individual ASAs to different stages of the audit process, so a visual to reinforce the basics of auditing. So at this point, I'm gonna switch over from talking to you to writing on my tablet, and hopefully you'll see that on the screen. Fingers crossed. Okay, so here we are uh, in, and I use the app explain everything for this, uh, and I guess we'll just try and document the audit process. So I'm gonna start linearly start at the beginning and, and go th through to the end. So at the beginning, we need to start with finding the client. Whoops. All right, so we start the audit with finding the client. And then once we find them, we're going to need to sign a contract. And for us as auditors, that contract is going to um, be modeled on the requirements in the standard 210. Okay, so that's pretty clear contract regulation. Uh, once we've signed the contract, then our next step is to plan the audit. All right, so plan the audit. Now to be able to plan the audit, there's actually a few sub steps associated with that. So you're gonna to need to understand the client uh, and that's a whole range of different things. Understanding the client involves understanding the industry, uh, the business, uh, the systems of internal control. So we do that to allow us to then identify significant risks, um, which in future will be called inherent risks, but you'll also see them called inherent risks. So let me draw some boxes here. So we sign the contract, then we're going to plan the audit. And planning the audit has a few sub steps, which I'm gonna do in a different color. I'll do these in blue. Understanding the client, which requires you to understand a few different areas to identify significant risks. So the planning of the audit, um, 300 is the initial one that says you have to have a plan. And then understanding the client and the risks comes out of 315. Now, once we do that, then we have to respond to those risks. So we have to 
Respond to risks by creating a plan. Right. And that plan is risk adjusted for the audit. Um, and that is really the domain of ASA 330. So 330 says when you have risks, then you have to do something about them, which is going to be creating the plan. Now the plan tells you you need to uh, design audit programs um, to collect evidence. So let me do this. I'm gonna move my little diagram a little bit. Uh, so we're going to, hmm, how am I gonna make this work? Maybe I'll go across, that's probably the best way. All right, so we're gonna create a plan and we're gonna have audit programs to collect evidence. Okay, and you're gonna have programs in a range of different areas. Those programs will be about testing internal controls. Um, you'll have audit programs on substantive testing in a range of different accounts. Okay, now how that's going to work, and I might do my audit evidence in green. So I'm gonna have my audit programs to collect audit evidence, which is going to be about testing internal controls and substantive testing. So that's after the plan. We're going up to this area here. Now, when it comes to collecting evidence, 500 is our major, um, standard there and it says we have to collect sufficient appropriate evidence and everything in the 500s covers different ways of collecting evidence so anything in that 500 series but remember one of the things that we're looking for is we're looking for material misstatements all right so materiality is sort of a weird account i'm going to do this maybe i'll do it in the yellow because I need to think about material misstatements sort of back here in the planning phase. I'm gonna add a little bit there. Uh, and materiality, I'm pretty sure is 320. All right, um, so I'm gonna to need to think about it at the planning phase and at the performance stage when I'm gathering um, my substantive evidence. Now, if I find misstatements, the next thing I need to do is evaluate them. Are they material or not? Do they require some form of adjustment? And this is where we have a, oops. And this is where we have a standard that sort of doesn't fit in anywhere. It goes after this part of evaluating um, our evidence. So I guess it sort of forms in there. But ASA 450 actually says, well, you need to figure out whether these are material or not. So, then we have to decide what adjustments are we gonna ask management to make or not make. So after we've evaluated them, we will come up with what we think the financial statements should be. And that means then negotiating with management. So there's going to be a negotiation with management about what the financial report is going to look like. And then after that, we are going to give our audit opinion Okay, we're going to give our independence. Oops, can I spell independence? Independence declaration. And we're going to report on our key audit matters. Um, so if you're everywhere in the world except the US, these are KAMs, key audit matters. If you are in the United States, they will be called critical audit matters, CAM. I don't know why that's different. Um, so the negotiation part, you know, is really quite critical and there is no standard on this. This comes from research and understanding of practice. So look for the work for, look for the work of Professor Ken Trotman on this area. Um, if you're interested in the research on order to negotiation. So then they negotiate and then they give their audit opinion. Now that opinion is going to relate to 700. Uh, 705 and 706, because that's unqualified, unmodified opinions. 705 is modified opinions, qualified, adverse, and disclaimer. And then 706 is emphasis of matter and other matter paragraphs. Then you're also gonna have to give key audit matters. Key audit matters come out of 701, 
or critical audit matters. Um, and that'll often link back uh, to, let me just change the color here. This will sort of link back a little bit to our significant risks because the things that you spend more audit time on and more audit judgment on are going to more often come up as your key audit matters here. Independence declaration here in Australia, that's something we have to do by law. So for us, that comes out of our Corporations Act. It doesn't specifically come within one of our ISAs or ASAs. So hopefully that's a good overview of the auditing standards process and how most of the standards fit in. Now I haven't covered every single standard there, um, but you'll get a general gist of the whole picture of things. So hopefully that's useful. All right, what else have I got in here? Ah, okay. So this question comes from Jimmy. Uh, hi Amanda, I've got two questions. First, what is a property asset and what business ratios could help identify the audit risk associated with it? And what steps can I take to reduce that risk? And then secondly, when a control is effective, we do a test, but what do we do if the control looks to be strong or good? Is there a trick? Okay, so question one for Jimmy's question was what's a property asset? So properties, uh, property is going to be things like uh, property plant and equipment is typically what goes into that particular line of the account. So property buildings, uh, plant could be machinery, equipment could be a forklift truck, it could be computers. So property, plant and equipment, um, those are those sorts of areas. Is there a ratio that you could use to identify a particular risk? Not really. So what I would do if I was looking at potential risk in property, plant and equipment, I might look at the percentage change in property and the percentage change in depreciation. So if property is increasing, depreciation should also increase. Um, I might also look at, so this would be more a trends thing rather than specifically looking at a ratio. How can you try and reduce the risk? Um, well, first you need to understand client internal controls around property. So what are the controls for buying new property, for selling property, for changing depreciation, for choosing the right depreciation? Now remember, this is an accounting estimate. So ISA, ASA 540 is going to come in here. Are they choosing the right depreciation method for any property, plant and equipment, the correct useful life, the correct salvage value? So to reduce risk, quite often it's important to evaluate, not just have they done the calculation, on depreciation and PP&E values appropriately, but uh, you know correctly, so redo the mathematics, but are they making the right choices there? So to reduce the audit risk and the risk of us missing something, I'd go back to management and I'd ask them about how are you making these choices around property, plant and equipment? All right, second question, when a control is effective, so we have a good control, then I wanna test it because I wanna rely on it rather than doing a lot of substantive testing. Um, if controls look really fantastic, I do want to collect a lot of evidence. So there's not really like uh, a trick to testing controls. The key is know what the control is and then test to see if it's working. So for example, I don't have my little public transport card here. We have a system called Opal um, here in New South Wales. I'd get my public transport RFID card and there's a control around that, right? If um, I tap on and I tap off, at one station, tap off at another station, it's supposed to calculate the fare. So I could test the calculation by selecting perhaps a range of transactions and making sure that that calculation matches what is on a company's website. Uh, another example might be bank reconciliation. So bank reconciliation has to be done every month. The manager might have to um, review the bank reconciliation and sign off. So then I would look for physical bank reconciliations and for the physical signature close to the date that the bank reconciliation was done. So that would be testing that the control is being done appropriately. It's important to remember that the control needs to be tested over the entire year as well, not just one month or one particular point in time. Controls need to work over the entire period. If I find one month where a control isn't working, that's one month where I could have misstatements and where I need to substantively test because I know the control wasn't working correctly. So Jimmy, I hope that answers your question on internal controls. Now I did have another question on one of my 
uh, videos this week. Let me see if I can find it here in my comments. Ah, okay. Hi, Amanda. Uh, this is from Neem, Neem Kader, three days ago. Could you please provide me with some guidance on how to formulate substantive procedures to ensure compliance to IFRS or international accounting standards? Uh, for example, recognition uh, a measurement of a deferred tax asset balance. That's a very specific one. Now, for designing any sort of procedure, um, you know, ASA, ISA 500 says, I have to have sufficient and appropriate evidence. So there's no rule there, specific rule that says how much is sufficient or how much is appropriate. But I tend to have four rules, and I always talk about these four rules in designing audit procedures. Rule number one is that you need to use the correct audit terminology. So ASA 500 has a list of procedures. Um, in a lot of my videos, I talk about the nine procedures. So inquiry, observation, analytical procedures, inspection of assets, inspection of documents, recalculation, uh, confirmation, vouching, tracing. All right. I use those nine procedures to generate every single audit procedure I ever need. So that's my toolbox, right? So I need to use those professional terms because I'm part of a profession, all right? I don't, doctors don't say, hey, I'm gonna chop off your leg. They say, I'm gonna operate on your fibia, tibia, whatever it might be. So using the correct terminology is important. So rule number two, so rule number one, terminology. Rule number two, use the client's information about what things are called. Am I talking to a purchasing manager or a purchasing officer or a buying manager, all right? So use client name so that when you ask the client, they know exactly what you're talking about when you ask for a document. Number three, and this is probably the one uh, that Naeem's probably more interested in, which is designing the procedure. And so I always say, if I can start with the assertion, what is the assertion about? Is it an assertion for existence? Am I designing a test for accuracy or for cutoff or for rights and obligations? Once I know the objective, what my assertion is, designing the procedure means using all that client knowledge and my audit knowledge to make sure that I'm collecting the right thing. So for recognition and measurement of a deferred tax asset balance, thinking about an asset. So I'm looking at existence, completeness, valuation, allocation, rights and obligations, and then presentation and disclosure. So in terms of the assertions, that's going to be the right assertion. Do I have a right to recognize that deferred tax asset? And measurement is going to be the valuation component. So I would write separate tests there. I would say, what is a test for choosing, making sure that I own the deferred tax asset balance? Well, I might look at evidence or documentation from the tax office or tax rulings or inter internal uh, evidence to prove that we really do have that deferred tax asset, that DTA. If I'm looking at measurement or valuation as it's known within ASA, ISA 315, then I'd be looking at, well, how is that calculated? Because often DTAs are estimates based on information. Sometimes they might need to be confirmed by your tax regulator, but I'd go back to those calculations and say, how should this be calculated? Am I, is the client calculating it the right way using all the right measures and components? And then have they done the mathematics recalculated appropriately, okay? So it would be multi-step, and then depending on how many DTAs there might be, are you testing one or are you testing all of them? You may need to select a sample. So my four rules are uh, use the correct audit terminology, use the correct client terminology, know what you're testing, design a procedure that's really specific. And that specific part is can somebody, if you go on a holiday or something happens, you get hit by a bus, you can't do your audit procedure, can someone do that audit procedure following your exact instructions. And then number four, is it fit for purpose? So if I'm testing right to a DTA, have I done a test that's actually doing that? And it really comes down to knowing what the assertion is for that particular account or transaction balance. That's always going to be the key. So I hope, Neem, that was useful for you. 
So thanks very much everybody for sending in your questions for the Q&A. Uh, I'll probably try and do these monthly. So um, if you do have questions, you can pop them on individual videos and I'll try and answer them. But if it is something more complex, then I can always save it for a Q&A. Hope you found this useful. If you thought the video was useful, I'd love for you to give us a thumbs up consider clicking the subscribe button to get up to date videos. I'm still working through all of the auditing standards. We're, we will by the end of the year have a full suite of videos on the auditing standards. Um, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.